To another episode of Fuente and Marifal present Meet the Professor. Hello, world. <laughs> hey, 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 Jose, Professor. How is everybody on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday? Absolutely amazing. You can feel the energy here is, is bubbling, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, you and now she's so hard. Now, now and, and now she's in North Carolina. Yes. Oh my God. I love it here. It's so gorgeous. The weather is gorgeous. The people are amazing. And the amount of lounges is really impressive. Absolutely. Another beautiful, beautiful part of the world. Jose, how are you? Well, I got up this morning at 3.30 in the morning, went to the airport in Berlin. First flight to uh, Vienna, then in Vienna, two and a half hours, got home about 12. A little bit tired, but had a hell of a week. I mean, that dinner last night with our good friend Manuela that you know very well and her sons, 40 people, elegant restaurant. We, we smoked the rainforest. Then I talked a little bit. And then we did the uh, Don Carlos Dobo Robusto. And then to make the night even better, the Opus Forbidden X13. Ooh. It was just amazing. All the events... All over Germany, people happy. You know the deal. They want more cigars, but <laughs> I mean, Don't what they can all. we do? That's Carlita. That's, hey, the most sought after doesn't come that easy, right? You know, there's a reason for I it. Know. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But it was good. Very good. Very happy. Very happy. And uh, everything doing well. Beautiful. Look at that. Your energy is bubbling. You're traveling. You're like the Terminator. You just never go down, do you? Yeah, you know, and you, you don't look days, like the Terminator, but you definitely act like it. <laughs> definitely. And you know, the, the thing is that in uh, what's today's date? The... I don't I don't even know today's <laughs> date anymore. The 23rd of October. There you go. Okay, so in a couple of more days, yours truly is going to be 73. Oh, yeah, years old. the birthday's coming up. 73. And he acts like a 13-year-old. How is that possible? 18-year-old. 18, 18. Because he knows how to do social media. <laughs> Probably. Probably. All right. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very, very special guest of honor today. Somebody that every single one of you knows, but not... You don't see him every day, but you see him a lot. He's a famous guy in the world of cigars, and we have him on our show. Very, very proud to present to you the one and only Aaron Loomis. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. That was short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's an honor to be on the show. It's, we're very, very happy to have you here. And uh, this is going to be kind of like flipping you on the other side of the table. That's right. Right? right. Normally, it's you asking the questions yes. to people like us. And now we're going to be asking the questions to you. Yep. <laughs> well, you seem very relaxed and calm. Yes. I can't wait till Jose pops in here. There you go. It's giving you a hell of a time. <laughs> All right, he does that every time know. he sees me. He does it every time. But don't worry. We're there. We're behind you. And remember... If anything goes wrong, you just wave your finger and uh, Uncle Jeremiah will come and help you. Will do. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Let's do this. Jose, be kind to the young man. No, we've been friends for many years. First of all, Aaron, that's I want what, to... That's what I'm worried about. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> First of all, Aaron, uh, uh, on behalf of all of us here on Meet the Professor, we want to thank you for accepting our 
invitation. Like I told you, I don't know why it skipped my mind. You know, with all the things going on and the traveling and Jeremiah and Carlito busting my balls all the time, you know, it's not easy. Right. But we've known each other for a long time. Yes. Uh, I've considered you one of the honest media people, very talented, very respectful. Uh, and I wish more people would, you know, follow the likes of you and Coop and Matthew and so many other people that have made a great, great difference uh, for our in industry. And I'm going to start off uh, like I start with everybody. Right. Tell me, what was your first cigar? Uh, my first cigar was a uh, Gurkha. Um, I think it was uh, a Red Witch. And um, I smoked that uh, in Orlando. Um, I go down there every a couple of years with a bunch of buddies for um, spring training for baseball. And uh, we went out to dinner um, at a restaurant that had cigars on the menu, the dessert menu. And uh, a couple of the guys decided that they wanted to get some cigars. And um, I had never smoked them. I was very against smoking cigarettes. Um, but I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. And um, we went back to the house after dinner, lit it up, uh, had an enjoyable time. And um, I kind of caught the bug right at that point. And uh, a few weeks later, I started looking around at cigars and humidors and things like that. And then uh, I kind of just went uh, in full force from that point on. <laughs> yeah, everybody has to try off with some of that. At yeah. least you didn't try off with some of the stuff that I'm not going to name of. That, you know, <laughs> just, just blows me away with what some of the guys started off with. Right. You started, you were a uh, co-founder. You are the co-founder of uh, Developing Palettes. But before that, you were co-owner of Cigar Distribution and Blind Puff. Tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, so um, right around uh, late 2012, early 2013, um, I was on a bunch of cigar forums because I was just kind of you know trying to learn as much as possible. And um, somebody had come up with the idea of doing a, a website, doing uh, blind cigar reviews with a panel. And uh, they were kind of throwing out ideas of you know how to kind of launch this thing. And I kind of jumped in and I was kind of given some ideas in regards to the logistics of that. And um, um, I didn't, at that point, I didn't feel like I would be good at doing reviews because I had only been, you know, smoking for like a year and a half, two years. And um, I just didn't think that I'd be good at it. Um, so I kind of teamed up um, with the guy who had the idea to kind of handle all the logistics of this. So um, I would be the guy that would um, get all the cigars, um, unban them. Um, you know, blank bands on them with numbers and then ship them out to all the different reviewers. And I was kind of tracking all the information on the back end of what number was what cigar. And I would collect all the reviews, kind of put them together for the website. So um, kind of did that uh, process for uh, till right at the end of 2015. So um, just close to three years of doing that and kind of gave me a lot of insight into um the media side of things in regards to how to, how a website works um, got me very in depth in regards to all the different brands, all the different lines, uh, the people behind those brands, um, things of that nature. Um, so it was a it was a great learning experience for me to you know to kind of go through that process. Um, and I, I would do like one off reviews; they weren't blind, but I would just do one here or there, kind of getting my footing into the, into how reviews worked on on the the smoking side of things to see if. I enjoyed it, um, or if I didn't want to do it, um, but I, I did enjoy doing that. I think you're muted, Jose. I kind of enjoy Jose muted. It's, <laughs> it, has, it has a bit of a romantic touch to it. Yeah. And uh, let's let's see what uh, Melanie has to say because Melanie, is this is enjoy. <laughs> You enjoy this as much as I do. We, watching Jose kind of go, but there's no sound <laughs> coming out. It's inevitable. It happens every show. It's yeah. like we need a buzzer. You know what? There, there needs to be like a, a whammy. You know, every time it happens, it's like whammy. Yeah, I'm yeah, mute. Yeah. <laughs> and then I get a call from his wife, from Emma, and, and she says, "Can you make this happen in real life?" And I'm, yeah. I'm, sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's it's just not possible. I don't have the technical ability to do that. <laughs> 
But anyways, let's let's get Jose back on because he's 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 gonna turn seventy three and that's gonna get worse. So yeah, let's let's get him back on. <laughs> you uh, leave the blind man's puff, and you come up with developing palettes. The name, did you come up with it? And uh, I know most of the guys that are with you, but tell us about why the name developing palettes. Um, yeah, I co-founded that with Jun Liu, who's um, a guy that I had brought over to Blind Man's Puff to be on the, the review panel. And um, he and I uh, became really good friends. Um, and uh, we kind of, um, kind of towards the end of 2015, um, I was looking to move on from uh, Blind Man's Puff and do something different. And he and I really saw, you know, eye to eye on um, kind of our thoughts on um, how cigar reviews should work, um, you know, what the process should be, um, a different scoring system, all that stuff. So we were, you know, we were kind of spitballing on ide ideas for a name of the site. Um, and every site, or well, most sites kind of have a name that have cigar in the name. And, um, you know, I, I understand that it is good for SEO and social media and all that stuff. But um, I think we wanted to do something that was uh, a bit broader, didn't kind of... Um, lock us into to just cigars so um we came up with this name just because we felt like we could pretty much review anything that had flavor to it um so we could do spirits we could do beer we could do whatever it is that we wanted to you know spend our time on doing reviews um and that that name really kind of lent itself to you know being broad enough to to do that so that's kind of how we came up with the name of the site and by the way i gotta say that you have on your uh and your team, one of my favorites, and uh, also of our show, we've had it, The Surgeon. Yes. And, of course, June, which I know very, very well, and my good friend, Seth Geis, that, yeah. in my opinion, probably has one of the best palettes uh, yeah. in yeah, the industry. Yeah, we started, it was June and I, and, um, you know, we were doing uh, kind of our side-by-side -side reviews where we'd have our discussions. Um, so we would smoke the cigars separately. And then we would do a video recap um, after we had both smoked the cigar so that we could kind of have a kind of a face off discussion. So maybe one of us liked it, one of us didn't like it. We can kind of have that discussion or we can if we both liked it or both didn't like it, we'd have that discussion, kind of get a feel for what was that was like. So um, it, it gave the ability to you know have a written review that people could read, um, but also have a video. And then we kind of take out the audio and put that on a podcast as well. So however people wanted to consume that that media, they could. Um, and then as time went on, um, we were always very interested in being able to put a put a panel together um, because it felt like the more people that could contribute um, on a particular review um, kind of cast a wider net to be able to match up with other people's palettes that, you know, they might not match with me or they might not match with June. And um, the struggle with that is that we're we have a very set idea on kind of how we think the review should be done. And we, we, we wanted people that we felt were very honest and straightforward in regards to that. And they wouldn't just say every cigar was good. So we, we wanted people that were, you know, very honest with themselves and could be honest with other people. And, um, you know, Seth and John are those guys. And, um, you know, we didn't want to just bring anybody in. And those, those, John was a guy that we were hunting for a long time. Um, Seth was, uh, also one of those guys, um, but he had his own site and, uh, you know, then he moved over to cigar federation and both John and Seth were there. Um, and, um, I kept always pinging those guys just saying, if, if you ever want to make a move, um, we have a home for you over at developing pallets. And, um, eventually I think June and I wore them both down and they decided that they would come over. And, um, I, I think we've put together, you know, a dream team. Um, I'm not saying myself, but. Uh, the other guys are are amazing guys, and I I couldn't imagine work with with guys that you know I trust and that I trust their palates to do reviews. Well, I got to tell you something, Seth and I I haven't talked to him in a in a long time. I know he's he's been busy. I've been busy, but I've talked. I remember when I would get together and talk with him, Seth is he's one of the few people when I did my blending seminars with the five rappers that right. guess him. There's only three people in the states that really uh, got him. Yeah. And Seth was one of them. Let me ask you this. Tell me the hardest the, the hardest person or the guy that's giving you the hardest time to do an interview and at the same time the easiest guy to do an interview with. 
Oh man. Um, I'll, let me start with, with the easy, the easy people. I think that's easier to come up with. And I actually just saw this today on my Facebook timeline is that um, I think it's two years ago to the day today is that Jeremiah came on the show with Coop and I. And um, if you want to talk about an easy interview, um, I, I would say that probably if you were able to pull this data, that that would probably the the least amount of time that you heard Coop or I talking on the show. Because the stories that Jeremiah was sharing with us were so enthralling that I think Coop and I kind of forgot that we were doing an interview and we were kind of sitting back as, you know, listening to a storyteller. Um, so that was one of the, that was one of the best and easiest going um, kind of shows that we've done. Um, but there are certain guests that, you know, also have that kind of a flow. Um, you know, Steve Saka is a very easy um, guest to interview. Um, Skip Martin's a very easy guest to interview. Um, but I, you know, I think that kind of lend, just lends itself to the people that I think in the industry that um, are very outgoing people. Um, you know, sometimes you'll run into somebody that is a, is a bit quieter and, um, that's just a bit of a tougher interview. Um, but kind of going out of the more difficult side, I'd also kind of maybe say Saka and Skip Martin are more on the difficult side as well, because they like to get on a rant and on a roll and you have to kind of try to rehome them back on track to what you're trying to, to get into the question. So, um, some can be easy and hard at the same time, I think. Oh, that I know that some people are uh, easy to deal with and uh, some people are hard. Yeah. And I know it's uh, hard to put uh, a question to uh, media people, somebody you have uh, have interviewed and gave you a real effing time and uh, you don't want to even uh, uh, bring it up. You know, you talked a little bit about... You should have uh, tried the professor. He's easy and hard at the same time. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'm not going to say which part of him is easy or which part of him is hard. <laughs> but but there's no question that he's an easy hard. Ain't it, professor? <laughs> Melanie, try to help out. <laughs> Carlito, Melanie, can't get Melanie's in. Melanie's just going to hurt you even more. Don't go in that direction. No, Carlito's trying to get in. I don't know what, what his problem uh, well, is. Right, let's get Carlito in. Hey, Papo. Oh, finally. What is it with you, old man? I have no idea, man. I'm still trying to figure it out. But let me tell you something. Thanks for reminding me. I'll go take my meds. Give me 10 minutes, please. <laughs> Aaron, how you doing, my friend? Good to see you. How are you doing, Carlito? I'm doing great. 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 No, let the show go on. Very interesting. Keep it going. Uh, before you said, and I've, I've heard, uh, you know, you and Coop many times on the show, you've been very, very critical on the rating system that everybody uh, uses. And there's a lot of points that you have mentioned that I agree. There's some that, you know, you never agree on everything. But right. but my main thing to you is, do you think, I don't want you to mention any media sites or magazine or anything sure. like that. Do you think that sometimes some people are too, too hard on certain brands, even though they're good brands, and sometimes they're uh, bad on brands that, uh, how would you say that they're good, but it just doesn't go into there and, and, and give scores that, you know, you look at them and say like, wow, I want to hear yeah. your opinion on that. Yeah, I think inherently people have biases, you know, they, maybe they like a certain brand because they just, they like the cigars, maybe they like a brand because of the people behind it. Or you know whatever reason they can have they can have a dislike for things in this in the same uh, fashion, but um, that that's the hard part about reviewing is that you have to try to take your biases out of it. Um, but I think that's hard for some people, and I think if you see you know some sites, you'll see reviews, and you'll you know kind of have a feeling for what brands they like, um, and you'll see kind of the scores reflect that, and you'll see some brands that they maybe don't like, and you'll see some scores re that reflect that. So. Um, yeah, you, I think you'll see that at times, um, in regards to people being too hard. Um, I think that's not the norm. I think, um, people being too easy is what typically happens. Um, every, you know, they think everything, every cigar is good. Every cigar is great. Um, nothing's bad. And then in that sense, you don't really get a sense. You can't really determine like what they think is better than something else because, you know, everything is great. Everything's roses, but, 
Um, the people that do that that are harder on cigars, um, I don't think um, you see that many people that will that will go that route. Um, and when you do that, um, I think you still have to be careful. I mean, you could you can say something's not good in a respectful way, um, but if you do it in a disrespectful way, I don't think that that's helpful to anyone. Um, I don't think it makes yourself look good um, and doesn't make the brand look good. Um, you know, there's a lot of people involved in making cigars and, um, you know, um, yes, you can have a lot of people that are working hard and they make a product that's maybe subpar, but um, there still has to be a little bit of respect there. Um, and I think you can, you can do that respectfully and just say that um, it wasn't a cigar that you enjoyed and you know, you would, you'd pass on it. So, yeah. You know, it's funny without uh, mentioning sites, I remember one year, uh, this site had uh, sponsorship only from one company. Yeah. And he did a top 10. And out of the top 10, three of the brands from that sponsorship was up there. And uh, yep. I'm not going <laughs> to mention the brands or anything, but I just like, wow. I mean, you really yeah. have, have to have balls to do that because yeah. one out of 10 is okay, but three out of 10, yep. come on, <laughs> give me a break. And I bring this up because I think that's why – I think the media people now that are doing it are doing it with passion, with respect, mm -hmm. with good uh, criteria, with good knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I've seen, I would say, in the last couple of years, some good people come in. But I've seen a lot of those Mickey Mouse uh, websites or sites that have disappeared. And they have disappeared because, you know, the smoker of today is not the smoker of three years ago or 10 years ago or 15 yeah. years. People have more knowledge. People are more conscientious about the brands. And people have learned to smoke. So I think that's one of the things that really, really impacts on the credibility of many guys like uh, you. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, you and Coop have been working for many years together. And I've never asked this question to anybody, but because you and Coop are so... Uh, good, and I know he's gonna laugh when he sees uh, <laughs> when he sees this. Uh, what what's the hardest thing that you have to deal with when you and Cooper doing a show? Uh, that's a tough question because he is uh, he's really great and easy to work with. Um, uh, man. Um, I get, I would say maybe if I had one gripe and this is really having a reach for something is that sometimes on the show, um, a guest might go down a rabbit hole and, uh, you know, we need to kind of stay on track and things like that. And he kind of lets them go a little bit more. Um, and I'll kind of give him some rope and then I'll, you know, if we get to a point where I think it's just, we're going completely off the rails and we need to get things back on track. I might kind of pop in there just to kind of get back on. Cause um, he, he's okay. I think running with a very long show, um, you know, he's the show that he does with bear, um, that, you know, they can reach three to four hours on a regular basis. And, um, you know, I, that's fine if you, you know, the audience wants to stay for that, but I think, I, you know, and we try to keep it, uh, at the, at the two hour mark. So I think maybe just trying to keep things timely, um, would only be, would be my biggest gripe. I know I, I'm, I'm not gonna, he knows I don't see, uh, all his shows, but I see, some of them and and i'm amazed like he gives them a lot of rope and uh yeah and we and i talk and he says wow you know what what, what could you really do let me ask you this you've been going to the pca for many many years you guys do an amazing job you Sorry, report I, was it, I have a question for you uh -huh. are you wearing a stethoscope <laughs> listen uh if you don't have anything better to do, let me do my job. Galito. Yeah. Oh, something's wrong. It's sticking out of his ears like hey, a stethoscope. I, I didn't have the balls to ask you, so I sent uh, Jeremiah a message. He had to ask you, man. <laughs> do, do you hear us? Or is that is one of Jasper's toys? Or do you actually No, no, hear no. Us I hear you. You know what I'm going to You know what I'm going to play doctor. It's you know like, what I'm oh, Look, the heart's beating. <laughs> you you know what, Carlito? It's a good point because uh, I'm I'm gonna go tomorrow, and uh, since I got a corporate card, and you said that I, you know, I don't spend a lot, but I will spend something very good on this so to look better. And I hope when they ask me in Tampa uh, who authorized that, I'm gonna say the owner of the company. So I'm going tomorrow to get it. I feel comfortable with these. 
And the other one, sometimes they don't fucking work. So leave me alone. T did you take your medicine? <laughs> not, not to after the show. <laughs> Sorry, Jose. It was just, it was just too much. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. To, to both of you. Aaron, you've been going to the show for many years. And like I said, you guys covered very, very well. Tell me things that you would like to see the PCA to do and things, thoughts that you've had, because we all talk, to make the PCA better. Even though I have to say we had a great show last yes, year. Probably the best show. show in the last five years, without a doubt. Quality right. and not quantity. Jose, when you ask a question, you have to let the guest answer the question. <laughs> Just... Ask the question. Let Aaron answer the question, will you? Yeah, but I got to ask sometimes two questions. What's wrong with you? Carlito, give him his medicine too. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the last show that we just had was a fantastic show. Um, about, probably the best show we've had in the last four or five years, I think. Um, I, I, would like the, I would like to see the show um, develop more um, on the day before the actual trade show uh, piece of it. Uh, I mean, this past... Um, show um, i didn't get a chance to attend but i heard that the show that um you and carlito did uh the session where you guys did uh the kind of the blending and talking about the the cigar you had handed out and all that i think that was a fantastic concept and i heard you know rave reviews from uh people that attended and saw that it was a nice line light out uh for people waiting to get in and i just think a lot more educational stuff um kind of on that first day would be would be a big help um i know they try to do seminars you know around um you know, helping retailers with their stores and things like that. I just, I just don't feel that they're um, maybe engaging enough or they're not um, kind of talking about the right things. I mean, having somebody that, um, you know, works re retailing for, uh, you know, pet food stores, I don't know that that brings a lot of information to the retailers that sell cigars. Like, I don't think that they, they match up. I mean, very different clientele, very different customer base and how the sales happen and things like that. It's just, I don't think they match up, but um, I think if they did a little more, you know, targeted education um, would be fantastic. Um, and some other ideas I've had have been just to, you know, create some fun, maybe competition style type things. Like if you had, um, I know like the Habano Festival has kind of a uh, cigar sommelier kind of competition. And I know we don't really have that kind of thing in the States, but um, if you had a kind of a, a tobacconist competition where, um, you know, you had set up kind of this trial where you'd have somebody that was walking into a shop and, you had somebody that was working at, at that shop kind of bring the customer in and kind of walk them through the, the purchasing process, kind of seeing how, you know, that customer service kind of works. You have retailers kind of competing in that kind of fashion for you know, a title of, you know, uh, best retailer or best tobacconist of the year. Like if you had that kind of a, uh, a draw and kind of excitement around things, people taking pride in what they do in their stores and kind of showing that off, um, not just are you show, showing off a competition, but, um, you may be giving other retailers ideas of how they and their employees can serve their customers in a, in a better way. So um, competition, education at the same time. Um, I also think with some of the manufacturers uh, and brand owners, um, if you did maybe a little bit of a kind of a blending competition, you know, you, uh, you brought in a, a set number of tobaccos, you know, 10, 12, 15 different tobaccos and said, all right, um, you have access to these 15 tobaccos. Uh, you have two hours to, you know, come up with a blend um, and then you set up some tasting panel and they, they will go through and smoke those cigars and you kind of see who just can take the resources that are available to them in that short amount of time and put something together that uh, a panel, you know, thought was impressive. Um, things of that nature. I, I know just watching people work in that fashion, if, you know, maybe people don't get a chance to go down to the factories and, and see what that process is like, but they can go to Vegas and maybe they can see that kind of work up in front of them. And I just think things like that would be really engaging uh, to the people that are attending the trade show um, and would work out well. Um, and that's, the, you know, the, we're just talking about that day, before, kind of the day before the trade show starts. But um, the trade show itself, I think it, it runs pretty well. I mean, um, each company is kind of on their own to decide, you know, how they want to present, how big or how small they want their booth to be, um, what they want the draw to be. Do they want to show off all the products they sell? Do they want to just show off the new products that they're ringing out that year? Um, you know, those are, those are, uh, really up to each company individually. And um, there needs to be excitement as well, I think, to bring people in. Um, 
and uh, what Carlito did this year with uh, the collaboration with Padrone. I think that was um, that was it had a ton of excitement um, going on at the trade show, and I think we need we need things like that to, to happen at the trade show, um, big reveals, um, big draws, and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, I'm not so worried about the trade show aspect of things i'm worried about the things that kind of surround it that day before the thing that really draws people in um to get people to to come to the trade show and, and support the pca you know it's interesting that you mentioned uh some of the things that could be done because last year after carlito and i did what we did board members and a lot of retailers you know came up to me about you know about ideas i think one of the things if we could get somebody to monitor, uh, I don't know, three or four guys that are doing well. Mm -hmm. Could be Saka, could be Nick Melillo, could be a couple of guys from DR, and, and you know, and, and go through that process, yeah. you know, right there. Because retail is, and I mean, the example you brought about the pet food, I mean, I mean, a guy selling really eat pet food, what? It's all, you know, in a row. If yeah. it's six months, if it's a year, if it's an adult, if it's canned food, that cigars is it, it, it's totally different. So I yeah. think, yes, we have to bring uh, exciting things. And uh, I've talked to with uh, Scott Pierce and I've been talking to uh, Greg Shimmerman. And, you know, anything that we could, us, uh, myself, Jeremiah, Carlito, our team, can contribute, uh, even if we're not part of it, but to give ideas. And I think it's very, very important the day before the show to have something that people just really want, that makes yeah. them go to the show, that if you don't go to the show, you're not going to be able to uh, enjoy that. Let me ask you this, because you go to a lot of shops. Tell me three things that you really dislike when you walk into a shop. First thing is if nobody acknowledges that you walked in. Um, I mean, that's, I think that just is, the, unless you're a regular and they know you and you, you just kind of go in and do your thing. But if you're new to it, you know, you know, new to walking into a shop, if there's just no acknowledgement or you don't see anybody and you don't know what's going on, that's kind of a, a, the first turnoff to me. Um, the second thing would be um, just not good upkeep. Um, you know, if you have, uh, you know, ashtrays full and ash all over the floor and things like that. It just looks like it's, everything's dusty and it hasn't been cleaned in who knows how long. Um, that's also uh, a bit of a turnoff um, to me. Um, and then uh, I think probably how the humidor is kept. Um, you know, you want to, I think you want to walk into a humidor, um, see everything kind of nicely in its place. Um, humidification is properly done. You're not seeing mold on cigars and things of that nature. I think you just want to be able to walk into somewhere that um, looks nice. It doesn't have to be a absolute showroom because um, I understand kind of a lounge mentality of, you know, wanting to be comfortable and things like that. So, but just being, you know, good upkeep, making sure, you know, things are the way they're supposed to be. Um, things aren't left to just degrade on their own and things of that nature. I think those would be the things that just kind of drive me crazy going into a, a retailer. Have you ever walked to, uh, to one of those shops, old shops that has the an old rug has so much dust on it, you can grow corn on it. Yeah. I'm going to plant some tobacco right here, guys. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of... I've been to a lot of those. Yeah. Without mentioning names, because in our, our show, because we respect every company, yeah. uh, without naming names of companies, have you in the last year seen a decline on the quality of cigars, bad drawers, tobaccos with a lot of ammonia, bad burning, tunneling, things like that. Yeah, I think maybe a little bit of this year, um, more on the construction side, maybe bad, you know, bad burns, um, tighter draws, things of that nature. Um, yeah, I, to me, I've kind of seen a, a slow degrade just over the quality of cigars the last two or three years, I would say, um, just kind of going based on our scoring system, we, we track, um, kind of what everybody's average score is throughout the years. And um, for the most part, all of, all the reviewers on our site, um, we've had a downtick in, in scoring for the last uh, two or three years. And um, I know that, you know, 
there's COVID related things and it, make, it makes it very hard on the labor force and, you know, trying to keep people that are well trained in their jobs to be able to, you know, construct the cigars and things like that. So I understand a bit of that. Um, but I also think that um, kind of this mentality of needing to come out with a new cigar every month um, kind of plays into that a bit. Um, you know, you are, you know, using um, multiple ta tobaccos, whatever you can find to put these blends together. You know, maybe it's not, uh, you know, the pre-production hasn't hasn't been done to the fullest. If you want to get something out or things like that, um, maybe the team is not uh, spending enough time, you know, working on this particular blend, and they're on to the, ne the next thing, and it's just constantly new, and they can't get settled in. I, I don't know how you know how all that works, but I think this the frequency of things also kind of maybe plays a, a part in some of these brands. Um, you know, a little bit of decline for them. So, um, you know, I, I I wish companies would spend you know more time focused on putting out a, a stellar blend, a stellar cigar, um, and kind of focus on that for a little while, and not get caught in that consumer trap of everybody always asking you what's new, and you feel that you always have to come out with something new to kind of keep their attention. Um, I, I'm I may be well not a minority, but in a minority in regards to the social media smokers, in regards to them always wanting new. I would prefer having, you know, readily available, you know, very good cigars um, from a brand that I can go back to and count on and not get a new release and then, uh, you know, say, oh, I really like this one. And I go back, try to go back to it six months later and they've already moved on to something else. And, you know, they may have already stopped production on that previous one. Just it didn't it didn't work well for them or they just want to focus on something new. So um, that that's kind of a, a tough spot and it may, it may play into some of that decline. Aaron, what is something that you've seen that's been done so social media wise that uh, shock you in a very positive way and something negative again without mentioning people or companies sure um i think at least from the kind of from the whole covid pandemic um a lot of the um brands and and retailers and things that started taking the social media for doing shows like this one, I start, kind of started in that time frame, but it's continued on and it's, it's done well as well. Um, I think kind of seeing those different perspectives from people and getting to know more about um, the people behind these brands and um, kind of their mentality and, and, you know, how, um, how their outreach to the consumers have been, um, has been pretty enlightening. Um, you know, you get to see um, who, who can do well in that environment um and who can you you know continually kind of uh change with the environment and see you know what works for them what doesn't work for them and how and just how they kind of continue that process of um growing their brand growing their outreach and things like that that's uh, that's all really really impressive to me um but on the other side of that um kind of the same thing is like you've seen some people that have tried that and they just kind of failed at it and that, there's no there's no harm in you know trying something and it not working out and you kind of moving on um but um, yeah, that you know the the new shows that came out that was good, um, but I think on the bad side is that um, when there's you know news pops up, maybe there's a, a disagreement in the industries, things like that, and uh, people are in a scramble to get people onto the show to kind of talk about it and things like that. Maybe there might be some information misinformation going on and things of that nature. Um, I just don't think it's a good look for the industry, and not that there's a bunch of eyes on us necessarily from outside of it, but um, I just think it kind of stirs up um, a bit too much drama. I mean, the media is always um, up for some drama, but um, it just kind of gets um, to be kind of he said, she said in a lot of cases. And it's um, it's sometimes it's better to actually, you know, take on a media role and kind of do some investigative stuff on the background to find out what you know, is really going on kind of for you. Just move out and give somebody a microphone to kind of share their one sided piece of things. Aaron, you look way too comfortable sitting in that chair. <laughs> yeah, it's and, fantastic. Uh, I can tell, and we're going to have to stir things up for you a little bit. So are you ready for the hot spot? Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. Hi, Aaron. How are Hello. you? Good. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm excellent. Now that I've got my uh, Wi-Fi working fabulously. 
it's always a pain. All right. So we're going to have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one that I wanted to ask was if there was anything that you could improve about the media coverage that we do have available about cigars, what it would, I mean, or the media coverage that we have, what's one thing that you would want to improve? Um, I would say just people being a little bit more, um, educated on the, the products that they're covering. Um, I think, um, not knowing kind of the, some of the history on things. And I understand some people come into the industry new and they're not, you know, they don't know the history of certain things, but, um, just being a little bit better in regards to, you know, knowing the names of things properly and, uh, things of that nature, you know, seeing people misspelling or saying the names of cigars. And I understand that, you know, a lot, a lot of the media is not natively Spanish speaking, but, uh, and a lot of the cigars are, but, um, you know, the, the one thing that comes to mind is Bovet, Boveda. I feel like yeah. that is the biggest name out there where that we're all like, no, it's Bo, it's Boveda. No, it's Boveda. No, yeah. it's Boveda. Like <laughs> the other one is um, Oliva and Olivia. That's a oh. lot of, that's, <laughs> one I, that's the one I hear a lot. It's in, and it's just like, uh, you, it's, I mean, it's, you know, just that's five bad. I think you can that get is it. That. Yeah. <laughs> Look, that's great. All right. What do you think constitutes a premium cigar? Uh, I think a premium cigar is um, uh, a cigar that uses uh, natural tobacco products um, and uh, made by hand uh, to some extent, uh, just not a machine made uh, cigar. Um, yeah, I think that would be a, a good definition of it. I don't think a, a price point is the is the definition, but I think if you're using natural tobaccos um, and you know using you know by hand for the majority of the of the part I, that that would be good enough for me how do you feel about whenever i say the word the power of the x uh power of the x is strong um yeah it's a well well recognized uh brand and um i think it carries a lot of cachet um so yeah it's a it's, got, it's a powerful message all right last one if you were to compare your first cigar to your first kiss how would you say that went uh, I would say my first cigar probably went a lot better than my first kiss. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I, I, I have to intervene on this, but you know, the first kiss could be a first black eye, the first cigar you could be puking your brains out. So, ah, yeah. which one is it? Yeah, exactly. Um, I think, uh, I think it's easier to fake uh, smoking your first cigar than fake smoking, uh, fake your first kiss and being good at it, right? So, I think uh, kissing is something that you need to. Uh, you got two heads versus practicing. one. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, I think my first cigar went better. Awesome. Well, thank you, Aaron, for joining us today. <laughs> oh, thank you. Jeremiah. That's it. I thought there was going to be like a last little surprise question. <laughs> I wanted to get Aaron all kind of red in the face with something really hot and personal, Melanie. <laughs> And I try, and he's, I try. he's sitting there. He's not even sweating. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. I know you're making me sweat. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's get back to the professor. <laughs> Aaron, a question that we have, we ask everybody. Person dead or alive, if you had the opportunity to smoke a cigar with, who would it be? Oh, man. Um... I would say probably uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, I just think he'd be a guy that would be uh, very interesting to talk to. Uh, very went to a very pivotal um, time in uh, this country, um, and uh, I just think he'd be able to share share a story in, in a great fashion. And uh, he, you know, I you know he did smoke, so I, I'm I'm sure that uh, that would be a good time. What tell me two things that are, are on your bucket list? Two things on my bucket list. Um, one is to travel to Italy. Um, I have never been yet, and uh, it is a destination I would like to go to. Um, oh, the last one, I oh, that's a tough one. Um, the other thing would be to uh, find the perfect cigar that would score a 10 on the developing palette scoring scale. How about that? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> in your case, you guys are are really, really uh, cigar geeks. Yeah. If you were, uh, let me let me see how I'm going to put it. If you were to choose uh, a person that's not with us to, uh, today mm -hmm. in the cigar industry to have a conversation with, who would it be? Mm. That's an interesting one. There's lots of great people to talk to in our, in our industry. Um, Man, this is a this is a tough question, Jose. And you know the funny thing? It's the first time I asked this question. Okay. Yeah. Um uh, let's go with uh George Padron. Um No, but I you got the uh, hold it. I, I think you got it wrong. A person that's not with us now. Oh, I thought you meant just not on this show. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Okay. That's that's not that passed away. Okay. But in this industry. Yes, in this industry, of okay. course. Oh. Uh, um maybe Zeno Davidoff. I think it uh that would be a very interesting conversation over that kind of a long tenure and um, how he brought things kind of to fruition with uh, the company and, uh, you know, the different technologies and things of that nature. I think that would be a, an interesting conversation. Without a doubt. Jeremiah, I think we need Rich. I always love bringing Rich in because that's a moment where I need to run the small disclaimer that this show is being broadcasted out of Basel, Switzerland. And anything you could hold against us, <laughs> <laughs> tough shit. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time for Rich's Riot. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Rich's Riot. Good afternoon, everyone. Aaron, great show so far. Enjoyed seeing you on the show. Uh, let's see, uh, Jose, we're still in the month of October, and uh, you didn't choose the right color shirt this week. You did good for two weeks. Uh, here I am with my pink paisley, and after uh, all these shows this month, I, I'm going to have to resort to a, uh, a pink uh, gingham check for next show because I'm out of my paisleys in pink. But uh, we'll go from there, and uh, since it's, you know, we're, it's when they met when we're pink and we're smoking some rare pinks, uh, I hope uh, I'll be able to get some of the two new ones that are being released. Well, <coughs> today's story involves some friends that we all have, the seven dwarves. Well, they all went to the Vatican and got a papal visit, and Doc went up to His Holiness and said, Your Holiness, are there any dwarf nuns in the Vatican? And His Holiness goes, no, there, there, there's no nuns that are dwarves here. He goes, okay, uh, uh, how about uh, in, uh, in Europe? Are there any, you know, nuns that are dwarves in, in Europe? His Holiness stopped. And, no, I don't think so. He says, uh, how about, are there any dwarf nuns anywhere in the world? And His Holiness goes, no, I'm sure there's no dwarves that are nuns across the world. Well, all the dwarves except Dopey start laughing like crazy, and they started yelling, Dopey, fuck the penguin. Dopey, fuck the penguin. So, uh... <laughs> well, at least it's Dopey, fuck the penguin, and it's not Jose, fuck the penguin. Ah! Oh, my God. 
Hey, Jose, where are the ducks? I fed them already. Don't worry. I feel like oh, he's goodness. on mute. You're I mean, mute, that, was, that, was, that was amazing. Wait, 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 wait. No, I can't. Let, no, no, come on. That was too much. Oh, my God. <laughs> God forgive us all, man, please. Anyway, hey, my father, you got to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. It's going from bad to worse. All right, back to you, Professor. Aaron. Yes. You know, you, since I've known you, you've been very, you've been very analytical, less critical. And Aaron, more... he's, he's known you since you were in the crib and you couldn't That's speak right. yet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Aaron, I, could just see, not... I could just see Jose pushing yeah. the crib down the street. Oh, no, Aaron. <laughs> With I don't Aaron get in there. Aaron was smoking a cigar. <laughs> it's like true. His brew gallon is Philip Morris. No. Yeah. No, I don't know about the carriage, but it's true. He doesn't get paid enough. <laughs> that, that I can put my hand on the Bible and swear to it. You want me to? Uh, you know, God, it's funny you say that because that's what I was. I, with the shit that I got to do first at work, oh, that, that to me, I could do it for free. But the shit that I got to take from you and Jeremiah, I mean, you're, there's not enough. Money in, in in the World Bank to pay me. So let me do my job. Professor, it's payback time. You know the shit I had to go through with Jeremiah and his brother, you know, and trying to be cool and everything in front of their mother who wouldn't have taken shit from anybody that would look sideways of one of her children. I would have got my ass kicked. So I had to I had to receive every poke, every punch, every undercut in the kidney, but never face to face. When I'm not looking from behind, so you know what? <laughs> it's, give give me an opportunity to be able to take that off you, my you, chest. You know, it's funny because in Dortmund, I learned something about the two brothers that I was like this. <laughs> <laughs> what? We're going to leave it at that. But anyway, <laughs> Aaron, tell me. <laughs> because. As we say in Spanish, mirale la carita a, a, a Jeremiah. Look at that smiley face. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying anything. I'm going to hide behind this green screen right here. Aaron, tell me, like I was saying in the beginning, you've been, you, you observe, you're very analytic about things. Tell me what you think. You don't have to give him any compliments. He's not going to give you anything. <laughs> What you can be sure I'm not going to give you and Carlito any compliments. He's not going to give you anything. He's too far away. There's nothing to mooch off of. He's Where are you right now, Aaron? California. California. He's in California, Jose. You're in Macedonia. It's not going to work. It's only 13 hours away. I can take a plane. Aaron, tell me what you consider at this moment right now the three biggest threats that our industry has. Numbuts one, Marifel and Jose. <laughs> um, three biggest threats. Uh, I think FDA is always looming out there, uh, you know, as a, as a possibility for something that, you know, caused an issue for us. Um, I, I also think maybe, you know, some of these issues um, like in Nicaragua and things like that, that, you know, you know, you hear embargo talk about, you know, you know, embargo against Nicaragua and things like that. I think those things can have some major uh, issues as well. I mean, if you saw an embargo against Nicaragua, uh, that's a that's a big deal. Um, you know, it's kind of a similar I almost think it's a similar fashion as FDA coming down. It, it you know, may shut down those industries in, in particular countries. And that's that's a big deal as well. Yes. Uh, but I also think uh, one of the big threats is also kind of from within the industry. Um, you know, I think um, some of this um, marketing that people are doing, I know people want to have fun and all that nature, but uh, there's a microscope on us, uh, you know, from the FDA and things like that. And uh, when you start putting um, cartoon characters on things or you start putting fast food uh, characters on things or you make things look like things that kids would want to go after, um, that can be dangerous at times. You know, all it takes is somebody you know, some kid picking up the wrong thing and, uh, you know, it getting eyes on it. Um, and that can bring us I, I agree. I agree. Form. Look at Jose with that thing sticking out of his ear. <laughs> you don't want kids picking up the wrong things. Trust me. <laughs> no, and Aaron, Aaron, it will happen. Yeah. And it will be used against us. Because oh, yeah. Because that's the only thing 
during all the visits that that my colleagues and myself went to Washington, that was the thing marketing to children. Yeah. And even though those, the congressmen, the senators, their staff who we spoke to, kind of, the, the senators and congressmen did, yes, of course, they yeah. understand. But they're not, they're not the ones that make the decision. It's, you know, it's the constituents. And yeah. it's, the, it's the message that's given out. And always, over and over again, the only defense that we had is that we do not market to children. They brought out a few examples, and we said that is not us, and we're going to take responsibility so that doesn't occur. Right. That was that was minuscule. That was nothing. That was two examples. Now mm-hmm. we're seeing a trend. Yes. Of, you know, of dozens and dozens and dozens, not to say more, which they'll accumulate, and we'll go back to try to defend the entire industry surviving, and right. they will use that to take us down. Yep. You see, you know, small players come in and they, you know, they want to start something up and they know that that's going to get them some attention. Um, obviously, the people are going to be buying it. I mean, other industries use it. You know, the beer industry uses it and uh, they don't have as big of a microscope on them. So they can kind of get away with some of that. So I think people, some people in the cigar industry think that they can do it as well. But um, I think we just have to be at a different level. I mean, you just, there's just there's just more more eyes. Um, there's always been a target uh, anti-smoking, the whole cigarette anti-smoking thing just sweeps cigars into it. Um, so people hear tobacco and cigars are automatically in it. Um, automatically. But it's it's cigarettes that's the real target. But cigars are just kind of connected somehow. They, they just, people just don't want, don't want to educate themselves. They don't want to distinguish between the others. Um, and it's different. So um, it's just like, uh, you know, you just always have to know that, you know, people are watching you kind of a thing. And they, yeah. they, they want to get rid of you as quickly as they can. So always. you give them any opportunity, they're going to take it. Yeah. Absolutely. Aaron, you're so absolutely sweet. right. Absolutely right. And uh, when when I mentioned the word us, they would take us down. Yeah. When I'm referring to us, the ones that will go down are the ones that came into the cigar industry after 2007. Yeah. A few hard-headed son of a bitches that you, you know, they're like cockroaches and rats. Yeah. They've been around and gone through hell and back. They'll stick around because their love for the industry. Yeah. But I don't want to be in the most, the largest, which is a mentality of a lot of international multinational companies. Yeah. I don't want to have the best penthouse in a building, which supposedly is going to have 20,000 residents. And I'm the only one who yeah. pays for the lights, who pays for the valet, what who's who's going to pay for the bartender or the entertainment or keep the air filters air filter, filters clean in yeah. that property and that's the way i see it we have to protect everyone in the industry yeah. but those that are in the in- industry have to be responsible and understand this is not a game and livelihoods hundreds of thousands as you mentioned in all parts of the world are at risk. And I think that it doesn't take much of a cigar brings you a little bit of pleasure mm-hmm. or something respect. It's a word that is very simple, but it really covers and embraces so much what is necessary today. Aaron, very true. Uh, uh, your response and Carlitos, my last question to you. How do you see the future of the industry in numbers, 2022, will we imports will be below the 456? Will we go down more or less around to 400, 410, 420? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, this is a tough one. Um, you know, we had that kind of a, a big increase during the pandemic. Um, lots of new smokers, I think, came in. Lots of people that got had the opportunity to smoke more, maybe working from home and things of that nature. Um, but at least in the United States and I, you know, I guess across the world as well, you know, starting to see inflation and things of that nature. Um, so it's a, it's a tough call to see how this is going to shake out. Um, you know, you kind of want to think that, um, certain industries are kind of a bit recession proof. Um, and I think maybe cigars might be one of those because people always want to have that kind of that pleasure. Um, you know, even when times are tough, um, it may just change the, which cigars people are buying and things of that nature. But, um, 
Yeah, I think that I think that there will probably be a, a slow decline, but I don't think it's going to be anything major um, right now. But as trends change with the economy, um, if we continue to see uh, uh, inflation happening and uh, kind of a recession happen and things like that, we, we might see a, a, a bit of a dip. Um, but um, I'm hoping that th there's not that large of an effect. Aaron. On my behalf, I want to thank you for being on the show. I mean, I've known you for many years. You do a great job. And your team, too, the surgeon, June, of course, Seth. Uh, I wish you uh, to keep continuing doing the great job that you do. Very honest. Uh, with a lot of respect for the industry, and you have always tried to help the uh, in industry as much as possible. So on behalf of myself, uh, and I know the others also. Thank you very much. Carlito. Aaron, first of all, thank you very much. It, it means a lot. And as always, I learn. And listen to you, there are several points that you touched on that I think are really very important for, for all of us as an industry of... Um, gatekeepers or guardians of something that, as you said, you have to understand history that goes back for so long. And we are here, but let's not remember, let's not forget where we come from and those that were there, that generation that that the professor asked about, who would you smoke a cigar with and yeah. so forth. Two things, and I know that the show has been amazing. You have been such a great contribution you represent the media, but you also represent a true brother and lover of the leaf. Thank you. Two things. And I don't want to prolong it, but I, I just feel I have to, man. What the fuck? You know, anyway. One was you mentioned along in the, during the show as an observant and also first. I always see you first as a lover of the cigar, the leaf, and the respect of the history and the knowledge that you have acquired over many, many years of hard work. First, you mentioned that it's disappointing that all of a sudden there's a new flavor of the week. Honestly, in cigar making, like in creating music, I don't care if your name is Paul McCartney or John Lennon, you're not going to write a song every single day mm -hmm. because a billboard or some editor says you need a new song for someone to listen to my program. So in some respect, the media is responsible. Sure. Talk about ratings. I've seen it happen and I'm not defending. I'm just saying we have to work this out and just, and we're going to get to the following conversation. I have seen, I remember in the very, very beginning when I, never left my neighborhood or the factory going to events. And someone, I sat in a table, very powerful person, says, Carlito, listen, this is your future. The ink is what sells. I had no idea what cigar tastings were about and so forth. We tasted cigars in our factory. And if it was good or was a piece of shit, you better make it better. Okay, this, it, wasn't, it wasn't acceptable to it. It was perfect. Right. There was no, you know, no. And all of a sudden they tell me Carlito the Inks was sales. So all of a sudden you start getting critics talking about power, this, that, ba, mm -hmm. ba, ba. And every person that wants to sell a cigar, but is not conscious of where they come from, start looking for the strongest tobacco and this and that to make a switch. It takes 10 years to age and everything to, for it to flower. This right. is going on and on and on. This, this is supposed to be a closing. But I wanted to go in the second part, which is so powerful, something you brought up. But I'm going to leave it for the next show. Because, Aaron, I wasn't surprised. Because I know you're there in your experience and so forth. And when the professor told me, and we said, bro, this is going to be a hell of a show. You have so much to share with us and everything. And I have so much I would love to exchange and ideas and so forth. But you're right on target. And I would, I would just want to say thank you so much for taking your time out and being part of this great show where I believe very strongly, as the entire team, we all do, if we don't document history properly, 
somebody's going to come and destroy it. Yep. We can't allow that. Anyway, God bless you and your family. And thank you for all you contribute to our beautiful industry. Thank you. It's been my honor to be on the show. And I just want to say I appreciate all of your support um, over the years. Um, you've, you've been great to Coop, myself, all the guys on my team. Um, what you guys do for the industry as well is um, amazing. Um, keep going. Um, don't, you know, be the gatekeepers. Keep the history alive. Um, you know, it, it's it's important. And we, we do need to police internally to, to keep things uh, moving forward. Uh, or else, like you said, it can be wiped out. Absolutely. And we're all one. And individually, we're useless, and nothing will ever come about what we what we all want is to make people happy and share the love all over the world. Exactly. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Mr. Loomis. Yes, sir. You know exactly what I think of you and your teams. You know how much uh, respect and affection I have for you as people, but also for what you're actually doing, which means a lot, as Carlito just said, not only to us, but to many, many people out there. Communication is king. Communication spreads love. It spreads information. Communication is the link between our hard work and the people who actually give a damn about it. And without that link, We're moving a lot of wind uselessly. Thanks to that link, whatever it is that we think we're doing can be shared with people who think they care. And in all cases, it makes everybody, again, as Carlito just said, happier. So Aaron, thank you very, very much. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for being a friend. And hopefully very soon, we'll be puffing on a good cigar together. Thank you. I look forward to that time. Ladies and gentlemen, another wonderful episode of the Fuente and Marifal. Meet the professor. Remember to take care of yourselves and of each other. And if you don't do it with passion, don't do it at all. We'll see you next week. Same place, same time. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you very, very much, Aaron. Great show. Yes, absolutely. Had a great time. That's fantastic. Thank you for